Okay, uh, why are there eggs everywhere? <laughs> Hi there, my name is Dorian and today we're going to take a look at your egg drawings. Now if you haven't seen the video that's titled Mind-blowing realistic shading tricks, I recommend you watch that first. And don't judge the title until you've seen the video. If you want to learn more about light and shadow and realistic drawing, check out my website and my channel. Now why are we talking about eggs? You may be thinking, Dorian, I'm not interested in drawing eggs. I want to draw cool stuff like portraits or figure drawings or characters. So what is this about? Don't be fooled. <laughs> this is not about eggs. It's about principles that you can apply to your work today after watching this video. Because I think if you can't draw an egg in such a way that it feels alive, that it feels real, that it has volume, that the sense of light is convincing, you're probably not going to be able to do that on something more complex like a portrait. So you guys have made over 150 eggs. I'm gonna analyze them and we'll see what we can learn from that that you can apply to your work. So quick recap, I spoke about how the tonal value changes as form rotates away from the light direction. And we spoke about the Lambert fall off, which describes how this tonal change happens very slowly at first in the light values, in the light halftones. And then the closer we get to the terminator, which is the edge, the country border between the country of light and the country of shadow, the closer we get to the terminator, the faster the tone changes and darkens. Right, and in the comments of the first video that we did, some of you mentioned, wait a second, you said this follows a cosine function, but if I plot the cosine, I get something like this. So what's going on there? Well, that's my bad. I oversimplified a bit. So there's one more factor here, and that is that the human eye doesn't perceive brightness linearly. So if you imagine a plane in front of you and you have a certain amount of light on it, if you double the amount of light on the plane, it does not look twice as bright. Okay? Now, if you really are interested in, in that kind of stuff, then there are two great resources. The first is Cambridge in Color. It's a fantastic website on photography and visual perception, especially their article on understanding gamma correction. That's exactly what this is about. The second resource is huevaluechroma.com, and this is David Brick's resource. It's phenomenal. This is where I actually found the original numbers at the beginning a couple of years ago. That's what the, the first video is based on. So feel free to dive into those two websites. There's a lot of great information there. Okay, I hope that answered that question. I also would like to do a quick review of the three common shading mistakes that I mentioned in the first video. The first common shading mistake is dirty lights. This happens when your light halftones get too dark too quickly. This actually didn't happen that much in your drawings. But look for these, for these three shading mistakes as we go through the egg drawings. You'll find them a couple of times. The second common shading mistake is this halo. That means the dark halftones are not dark enough. If you don't go dark enough just before the terminator, you'll get this ring that looks a bit too light. That happened actually quite a bit. Then the next one, which is not directly related to the Lambert falloff rule, but it happens so often that I, I wanted to point it out, that is to make reflected lights too strong. Okay, very common, watch out for that. Now, I'd like to, because we now have a foundation, add one more, a fourth common shading mistake, and that is not to draw the ambient occlusion, to forget about ambient occlusion or not be aware of it. If you don't know about ambient occlusion, look it up, it's powerful, it's really important. Let's go into your egg drawings. I looked at every single one and I chose I don't know how many, but a lot of them, and I organized them. We are going to start with cute. I mean, look at this guy. <laughs> He's so cute. The drawing is actually really well done. There's a lot of good things happening here. Nice job. I also really like the scale down here on the bottom. That means this person really took time to make this understanding their own. Make sure that they get it. Write it down, have it in your notes. Thumbs up. 
It's just so cute. This one I also really liked. It's pretty funny. And I talked about ambient occlusion just a moment ago. And I'm gonna take this image into Photoshop and actually add ambient occlusion and we'll see the difference that that makes. Okay, so ambient occlusion happens in the shadows. So I'm going to select the shadow here. And then I'll work with black and a big round brush, low opacity. So wherever the eggs are blocking ambient light from reaching, that's where ambient occlusion happens. It's gonna be most visible where the eggs are close to each other and also close to the floor. So I'm adding occlusion shadows to the floor. I will also have to add occlusion shadows to the eggs themselves. So that's before and after. Notice I am not doing something like this. I'm making a gradient. The strongest occlusion is gonna be in there. Then let's do the same for the eggs. I'll probably have to do one at a time so let's do this guy first. So I'm adding occlusion where this egg is behind the other egg and it's getting close. Okay, on this egg, it's gonna be mostly down here where we have the occlusion. Maybe slightly here, but I think that's already too much. So let's stick to down there. And then last one, and let's see if I'll do the guy in the background as well. But this one is really important. By the way, Command H or Control H will hide the Photoshop selection. Okay, that's better. I think that will have to do. But if we compare to before and then after, maybe it's even a bit heavy, but I hope you can see that it feels more real. It feels more volumetric, less flat and graphic and cartoony and a bit more real. So if that's something you want, then this is a way to do it. All right, back to these images. <laughs> Look at him. Or her, or it. Oh, I fell in love. I actually printed this out and put it on the wall <laughs> behind me. Oh, there was one more. This one I thought was pretty fun too. And a nice shape design. And it looks super simple, but it's not that easy to do something like this, I think. Like we see the highlight inside of the pan and the texture that this suggests is perfect. And the contrast is really nice too. This would be ve very simple, or sorry, very easy to overdo, to have too much contrast on this white line and ruining the effect. So it's graphic, it's simple, it's... Yeah, I like it, <laughs> good work. Okay, next category, effort made. I'll start with this image where again, I can see that this person really took the time to understand the idea here and the drawing is pretty well done as well. It's refined, it's clean, works well. We could have a little bit more information, more tonal change in the lightest halftones. I'll talk about flat lights in a moment, and it's happening here a little bit. I like the few posts where you showed the stages. I think that's also really nice. Yeah, I can see this is a drawing that you have spent time developing. You cared about this drawing, and I think it shows. There's a little irregularity in this area, some noise in the tones that are a bit confusing. And with the Terminator transition being so soft, I would expect the penumbra or the cast shadow to be a bit softer too. But yeah, good work. Some of you posted the egg in different media, which I think is phenomenal. That's a really great idea. Yeah, awesome. Some of the tones here are getting a bit messy. Watercolor is difficult to control. Just, yeah, when there's too much noise, also in the gouache one, then the form gets confused or the brain gets confused in trying to understand the form. But keep doing these and see if you can control the medium to do what you want and describe the form the way you want it. Here, another one in pencil and then in acrylic, I believe. So I like playing the background against the lighter part of the form. That's a good compositional idea. And then here we can see that this person actually had a perspective construction. There is one thing here, which is that straight corner. And I think if we have a continuously curved surface, then the Terminator probably cannot create any sharp edges and jumps. So maybe that's a simplification that happened from the way you constructed it. It looks like it's still showing up a little bit here, a little too 
pointy, too angular on the Terminator. On the acrylic one it looks better, smoother. Here the dark halftones could have gone a little bit darker as well, and that's working better in the acrylic, although maybe it's getting a bit too dark, so some slight amount of dirty lights is happening here, I think. Here again, different media. These are looking good. I like the pen, because there you really have to control how you're showing the tones. And this one I thought was interesting. So it's a framed image with drawing on the glass. And <laughs> we got this one too. And to be honest, I think there's, enough, there's so much happening already in the painting. I think the stuff that's on the glass, to me, feels a little bit rushed, a little bit careless, and it pulls down the quality of the work. Like if I bought this painting with the frame, I would probably replace the glass or, or clean this drawing on the glass off. But very creative, very cool idea. Then we also have this image, which is pretty refined. I see a lot of attention on edges and softness throughout the image. It has a little bit too much of a digital feel for me, and that's probably caused by having or by not having any edge variation on the contour of the egg and by the modeling being too soft. So there's some texture up here, but I think we need a bit more. I made this image here to show that texture shows up most strongly in the dark halftone area, right down here. If you squint, close your eyes and look at this image, the texture is not that noticeable up in the lighter values. But as we get down here before the Terminator, that's where all the the noise and contrast happens. So I would do that same thing here and then also a bit in the lights. Values are looking great. Now let's continue with some notes on refining your drawings. So here's a nice clean little drawing and it looks really good. But if I look more closely, I see that there's a darker area here and then lighter areas around it. This contradicts the value change that should happen if there's one light source and a continuous change of form that happens on an egg. So to my eyes, this drawing reads a bit as if there was a form change. So it's curving out and then it looks like this comes out and in and then out again. Almost something like this. We get light here and light here and light here. So it's really important to have the value change continuously. If I zoom in, this becomes less visible actually. So if you step back or zoom out, you will see these kinds of effects more easily on your drawings. So to correct this here, I think we need some darker tone on the bottom and maybe lighten this spot here slightly. Still needs more refinement, but if I go back before, you really see that dark spot now before and after. So similarly, this drawing, everything is, is in place, but I think if you refine the tones a bit, this will be much, much stronger. This one feels better. And when I say feels better, I'm referring to the sense of volume that I'm getting. This feels round to me. This has weight, has mass, has presence. Whereas this doesn't that much because of the noise in the tones. I have an article about this on my website, which is called How to Get Smooth Shading in Pencil or Charcoal. And there's a method I use, which is called Island Hunting. So how do you get from a, from a noisy tone to a cleaner tone? And I recommend that you try this out and push at least one of your drawings. And maybe it's this egg drawing that you've made. Push it and see how refined you can make that tone. This trains your visual perception and your control of your medium which are two very important things, I think, if you want to draw realistically. Okay, there are two examples of egg drawings that are not from social media. They were done in one of my classes. And you can see the difference here, I hope, where the drawing is just more refined and the illusion is more convincing. Okay, let's talk about flat lights. So again, here, the drawing looks pretty good, pretty clean. We have a good shadow, we have dark halftones, I can see them clearly, but then in the lights, it's all flat, it's all paper. This is better than having the dirty lights problem where you have tones here that are too dark. 
but it's also not great. So if you look through a bunch of these drawings, we're having the same issue. Just not enough information in the lighter half tones. Basically what this reads like to the brain is overexposed images. So if I take this photograph and I do a level adjustment, see, now we don't have any information anymore in here. That's what the drawing looks like when there's just only paper and no tonal change. So ideally the paper should only be here and then you have to work with subtle control to have the tone go a bit darker, just a touch, and then darker, 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 darker. Sometimes it will even feel like the image is glowing because that's the way to show light sources. If you want to show a convincing light source, you just put white, complete white, in the surface of the light source, like painting the sun. That will make it look bright. So here, this feels almost like a light source because it's it's white and no value change is happening. Here, we looked at this drawing before, really good, up to the, like all the way up to here, and then it goes flat. So I would recommend to finish this drawing. There's not much left to do. and It will be a much more beautiful drawing. This one is from my demo. You can see it's, it's kind of rough. I actually did this pretty quickly, but it has information all the way up to what I call the center light, which is the lightest half tone value. This image you can see that there is subtle tonal change everywhere, even in the lightest half tones. Next, flat shadows. You can probably imagine what this is about. And if you look at these images that I collected and grouped together, there's a theme. And the theme here is that the shadows are really dark and there's nothing going on inside of the shadows. So in a way that's the opposite of what we just saw before, where instead of bringing in the lights and flattening them, it's bringing in the darks and flattening them. And the result is that it doesn't look convincing either. Here's my demo again. You can see that there's reflected light and there's also occlusion shadow, which is this darkening here. So the occlusion shadows are shadows within the shadow family. They're caused by two surfaces being close to each other and blocking the ambient light. Another important factor is the environment color. So in this image, you can see the light family here, and you can see the shadow family. If I change this brown floor and replace it with a white floor, you can see that all the shadows are getting lighter. And if I change, replace that white floor with a black floor, it's a dramatic change in the image. The light is still the same, the object is still the same, I'm just changing the floor and the environment around my subject. See? So you might get pretty dark shadows, close to black. Not black, but close to black, if you have a dark floor. But in these drawings, the environment is pretty bright. Let's say in these over here, when everything behind the egg and on the floor is white and you have black shadows, it just doesn't look right. I'm gonna do a demo of one of these eggs and actually work on the shadow. I'll choose this image here. And to make things a bit simpler, I will turn into black and white with a black and white adjustment layer. Now, this is a bright environment again. So what I'll do to start with is lighten the values. So just from that very dark shadow, I'll bring all the darks up. And then I will add occlusion shadow back into it. So first in the cast shadow, I'm working with black with a soft brush. And basically, I'm adding occlusion shadow right here. Occlusion shadows, again, happen wherever two surfaces are getting close to each other, blocking the ambient light. And just doing that, we get more space, more volume, more realism. But we'll do the same thing on the egg as well. And at the moment, there's actually reflected light right here. And that is the place where there will be very little reflected light. And actually, the opposite, there will be occlusion shadow darkening those tones. So again, I'm picking black and working really along the edge, all through here. And some people think of occlusion shadows as kind of lines. They might do the occlusion shadow with a hard brush like this. It's never like that. Occlusion shadows are always a gradient. So make sure you draw them as a gradient. 
if we do this right, it should feel like these two surfaces are touching each other. Okay, so we have before and after. I lightened the shadows overall and I introduced the occlusion shadow into it. Now this egg feels more like it's actually sitting in that environment. And I think that makes my point here. I think this happened maybe because I was explaining that the values in the light change from the lightest values, go down, down, down slowly, and then faster, 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 until it goes to black, like no more light. But this means these areas won't receive any direct light from the light source, but they're still receiving reflected light and ambient light from the floor and environment. So if I make this floor totally black, for example, now we don't have an information here and it does go to black. But this is not a black floor, so there's going to be some reflected light. All right, some tips about photography. So we'll start with comments about framing. Some of your eggs are going out of the frame, and if that's intentional, that's cool, but I think many of them that was not intentional. So when you're taking the picture, make sure that the subject is framed the way you want it to be framed. Here are two examples where I think that is working pretty well. Next, focus. That just means letting your camera focus and not having a blurry image. Uh, if you have low light, then it's more likely for your image to get blurry. So make sure there's plenty of light when you're taking the picture. And double check. And if your image is blurry, don't post it. Reshoot it. I mean, compare this with that. And it's just so much nicer to look at. So again, two examples where the image is nicely in focus and we get a sharp, clear image. Then even lighting across your paper, across your page as you're taking a picture. If you have a hot spot like that and cast shadows or light fall off like this on the edges, it tends not to look so good. If you're doing that, do it intentionally. If you took the picture and you see that that's happening, have the discipline to retake the picture. It's really worth it, I think. So here, two examples, again, of nice, even, consistent lighting. This really makes the work look its best. Then exposure or levels. This means if your image is too dark, it was underexposed. If it is too light, it was overexposed. It might even be a digital work where it has to do with whether you choose white like pure white as the canvas color, which I would really recommend against. If you're doing a digital drawing, have your background be like 90% light or 85, but not pure white. It's too aggressive. Two more examples of good kind of exposure setting or level adjustment. And a lot of this you can actually fix in Photoshop. Right, if that is your drawing and there's no easy way to take the picture again, then do a level adjustment. This is Photoshop, but you can do that in almost any digital painting image manipulation software. See the histogram. On the left, we have dark values. On the middle, we have kind of mid-tone values. The higher the mountain is, the more pixels of that tone are in the image. And on the right, there's the light values and there's nothing there. So if we drag this controller to the left, we're shifting the mountain to become more lighter tones. And I think if you post a drawing that looks like what we have on the right, it's much nicer than what we have on the left. Okay, and then white balance. This is also related. So some of these images are looking quite blue and cold. Some are looking warmish, orange, red, or yellow. And again, I would just take this into an image editing application and make sure that the white balance is working. It's looking good. You can even do this on many smartphones now. You can adjust the color balance. I'll take this image here. So we could use Command U and simply turn down saturation. What I prefer doing in Photoshop is to use the adjustment layer. It's called the black and white adjustment. Because here you can control the value of each hue separately. So here I'm working with the blues and I can make sure it looks like I just have more control, make sure it looks good. In this image, I would also add a level adjustment and slightly bring up 
the brightness here. So from a pretty blue and slightly dark image, we go to a neutral. This looks like white paper and good exposure. And then I have this image here, which actually was the original photograph of my demo drawing. And it's pretty good. It's in focus. It's framed with plenty of space around it, so I can crop it the way I want. But it does have these dark tones on the left and right side. And that's because I used a small lamp to light this drawing. I was traveling, didn't have more equipment. Probably should have shot it in natural light, but this is what I got. So here, I would probably also do a little bit of a value or level adjustment, being very careful not to go into the mountain here, because if I do, I'm going to overexpose right, and get flat lights again, which I do not want. So find the, the sweet spot. And then a technique I use to get rid of these things on the sides, this darker tone, if you can't see it, I will make it a little bit stronger. It's almost like this. So what I like to do with that is another adjustment layer for levels. Again, bring in the lights more, which will overexpose the center. So I'm turning the layer mask of this layer to black. Command I, Control I. Now I don't have this adjustment layer applied. But then I'm painting with white on the adjustment layer. I'm doing that on the edges. So I'm applying the level adjustment, but selectively. I could paint anywhere I want, right? and I'm just painting the effect of the adjustment. Next, the penumbra. So some of your drawings were quite sharp, very sharp, on the edge of the cast shadow. Others were very soft. As long as you have a plausible relationship between the penumbra, which is the edge of the cast shadow, and the terminator, so here they're both soft, if you have that relationship working, I think a lot is already good. But there's another thing happening that distance from or between the object or the terminator and the cast shadow will determine how soft or sharp the cast shadow is. So just to make things clear, this here is the penumbra. And if you have something like this pole or stick, you can see how it gets sharper as it is closer to the object and then softer as we get further away from the object. The type of light also has a big influence. So if you have a small point light source, you'll get a sharp cast shadow. And if you have a soft box or a bigger light source or diffused light source, you'll get a soft penumbra, soft cast shadow. And then we have arrived at my favorites already. So I like this drawing a lot and these two are by the same artist. So this image, I think, the form is just working really well. We have the lines of your mark making are following the form, which is a subtle but really effective way to communicate volume and roundness. The reflected light is probably as bright as what you can get away with. If you make it brighter than that, it will start breaking the image. Here it's very dramatic. You also have the strong red color. It feels like a sketch, so you can get away with a bit more, more dramatic choices. And it's definitely working. This is a great piece. The only thing I would consider playing with a bit more is the background. The shape of the background feels a bit random and I think you could do something fun to make it more like a finished piece. And in this drawing I also really like for the bold color choice. The modeling is pretty strong as well, very convincing. No flat lights, no flat shadows. Cool, yeah, nice color variation. The framing feels a bit odd, like we're touching the corner with the cast shadow here. And it's difficult if you have a single object like this. The obvious choice is put it in the center. If I did this, maybe I would put something in the background, some other shapes that we can create a more interesting composition. The main thing I'm missing here is playing with the brush strokes, with the paint application. Even, or maybe especially because it's digital, I would like, this is looking so flat and, and boring that I want to see some, some fun action with brush strokes. It doesn't have to be much, just on the floor it's nice if you can have brush strokes also helping to show the, the perspective of the floor. On the egg, like what you did on the pastel drawing, I think it was, to have a few brush strokes following the form. And in digital, 
you can even do hatching like this and then erase these strokes to <laughs> leave just the amount that you want. You, like, there's no excuse. You can control everything very, very subtly. And now that I have this here, I think even with the color, you can play with having some hue variation in there, some value variation. Go a little bit brighter, maybe even we try some blue. Just adding more complexity and richness. When you zoom out, you, if you do it right, it's not going to be distracting. It will just add more complexity in a good way, more richness. Then this image I like. I think it's nice. It's well balanced, well composed. You're doing a lot of overlapping, which is excellent. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to make a bunch of puns, like excellent work. <laughs> it, I'm really excited to look at all of these drawings. Yeah! I think you're being very expressive here, but yeah, well, too late now. I like the values. I like that you're playing with the thickness of the lines. So light is coming from the top left if I look at the cast shadows and your lower right outlines are thicker. So that's helpful, but then on this egg, you're breaking that rule, that consistency. And I think with the light direction from the left, this line here should actually be thinner, and this one here is the one that should get the bump in line weight. Then the center light of the leaf, I would really keep super thin, very subtle. It will make the leaf feel or read much better. This one I called out before. I just appreciate the person taking time to understand the principle. Nice background also, nice softly, softly fading out. And this one, you know, I really genuinely like it. I think some of you will look at this and think it's just messy and too dark and what's going on. It maybe looks sloppy. And I don't know what your intention was. If your intention was to make a realistic egg, then yeah, it's not working. If that was not the intention, the intention was just to make a, an interesting painting of an egg. This speaks to me aesthetically. It reminds me of Masao Yamamoto, a Japanese photographer. Minimalist photographs, they're beautiful, they're poetic. To me, this has some qualities of that. I like all of these little shapes of the white showing through. Not a fan of the paint crumbles. I would take those off, but otherwise, really, I like this. This one, I enjoy the composition, the placement. It's very dramatic. I think this egg is the main actor on stage performing a solo, like an opera singer egg or something like that. Here, I think this would become much more convincing. It would gain a lot of presence if you added thicker paint, more impasto. There's still a lot of the canvas texture showing through. And I'll try to do it digitally. It will not be the same, but as I add more opaque color, and if I was painting this, I would actually ignore the highlight in the beginning and just add thicker paint and then plop the highlight on with an extra amount of impasto. See the image on the right now has more convincing form because here the canvas texture actually flattens the image. And the way I'm doing this, I'm approaching this, is lighter value equals thicker paint. So it's actually good to have thin paint in the darks. And here, you can get away with having transparent paint. But then as you get into the lights, I would go thicker and thicker, the lighter the value gets. This is also happening a bit in this image, which is really nice overall. Right? The composition is working, the values are really good, but it feels like the thickest paint is here on the highlight, which makes sense. And then here it feels quite thick. Then here it's thinner, here it's thicker, here it's thinner again. Instead of that, I would do quite thin, quite transparent in the shadows, and then a bit thicker, a bit thicker, a bit thicker, a bit thicker, thickest on the edge. That's the center light area. The lightest half tones are there, right? With this light direction, we'll get the lightest halftones on that area. And then, yes, the specular reflection, the highlight, is even lighter than that and should be even thicker. And currently, 
The thicknesses of the paint feel a bit random and an important thing that might feel subtle but I think it makes a big difference is this guy here. That texture buildup is putting extra tension on the fact that this is paint on a flat canvas and it weakens the illusion that this is a three-dimensional egg that's sitting in front of us. So if you can scrape this off or flatten it with a palette knife, I think the painting will also gain a bit more illusion strength. But beautiful, well done. This one I really liked as well to see a drawing with white, it's probably white chalk on black paper. If you have never done that, try it. It's a good exercise. It requires you to think backwards, which is a good thing to do. It's beautiful, just needs some more subtle light information. This one I really like for the color. It has personality. Doing soft transitions like the reflected light is quite difficult and that's working really well here. I think there's only two images left. This one I liked for the contrast and the composition. It's, it grabs my attention. Definitely it's, it's interesting. I feel like these form shadows are a bit too dark. They're heavy. Again, this environment looks like a very bright environment. So there would be quite a lot of ambient light making all these shadows lighter. To show that, I made a 3D model in Blender. So we've got an egg and the floor. And most importantly for this explanation, an environment. And you can see the color of the environment over here. And I'm gonna make this environment, let's go darker first and watch what happens to the form shadow of the egg. So I'm gonna make this environment black. Okay, with a black environment, there is no ambient light coming from the environment. So there's nothing to shine into the shadow. It's just not receiving light from the light source. And here, <laughs> this render engine is not calculating reflected light. Let's see what it looks like with reflected light. Okay, so we're getting some from the floor. Let's also make the floor darker so we can really focus on the ambient light. Maybe I'll hide this one. There we go. So now you see a little bit of reflected light, but the whole form shadow of the egg is quite dark now. So what I'm going to do is go back to the environment color and lighten up the world. I would like you to observe the value of the form shadow of this egg. Okay, lighter environment means lighter form shadow. The cast shadow is gonna be affected as well, but this is a darker material now, so the shadow of that material will be darker as well. If I lighten the floor, you can see that cast shadow also lightening. Okay, so if we go back to this image, here it feels like these form shadows are the form shadows that we would have in a black environment, but we have a white page which suggests a light environment and that's a little bit of a conflict there. You could get this look if you have a white floor and a dark environment. So it's definitely possible, but it somehow feels like these eggs don't quite fit in that environment. The last of my favorites is this one, and it's just so cute. It just makes me happy. So thank you for making it. Finally, I have two images I would like to share with you as studio tools. You can download the image files in the blog post that's associated with this episode. I assume that will be linked to in the video description as well. Both images are about the modeling factors. Modeling factors are those light effects that create shading, volume, realism. So when you're working on a drawing or a painting and your goal is to create a realistic light impression, I suggest that you use these images like a checklist. Make sure you have all the modeling factors in place. Here they're pointed out on a sphere and on the second image I am pointing out each modeling factor individually on a more complex object. So study these and I hope that they're helpful for you. I also hope that you learned some good stuff in this video. I hope you had fun. I definitely had fun setting up all these eggs and looking at all of your drawings. Thanks again for participating. Thank you Proko for having me on. It is always a joy and a privilege. I'll see you guys on the next one. Until then, take good care. Bye bye.